Hello everybody and welcome back to my blog. Now this week I'm doing a topic which one of my subscribers requested and that is psoriasis. And I've been saying I'm going to do it for a while and the reason I've taken my time is that it is a massive topic. So before we start a warning, this is a very outline view of psoriasis and there's much more detail and I will put some links to some detailed sites in the comments afterwards. And the second warning is that there are some crazy words in this blog and I'm going to get them wrong because they're nearly impossible. Um, they're drugs that are used for psoriasis and they're unpronounceable. But I'll do my best and obviously I'll put them in the links afterwards. So, to start with, what is psoriasis? Well, it's a skin condition and it's very similar to eczema um, in that it's dry skin and it's flaky and it's sometimes itchy, but it's more than a skin condition. Um, the skin condition is the basis of it, but it is also a skin condition that affects people both psychologically, physically and emotionally. It really can be quite debilitating for people that suffer from this condition. It also causes other problems. So it's an immune system response that causes skin problems and now symptoms and sometimes even an arthritis. So it's a serious, all-encompassing condition. What happens in psoriasis is that the skin replacement speeds up and usually our skin cells replace themselves every 21 to 28 days. But in psoriasis, they replace themselves every few days. So skin turnover is going much, much quicker and that causes what we call plaques to develop on the skin, which are clusters of dead skin that can be silvery um, in their appearance. The plaques can be flaky, scaly, they can be red on white skin and dark on darker skins. They can go on every, any single body area, but different types of psoriasis, and I'll go through the types, um, tend to focus on different body parts. And as I've said before, these plaques can be associated with an arthritis, which is quite serious. Okay, so who gets psoriasis? Well, we know that about 2 to 3% of the UK population suffers, so that's around 18 million people. It's a lot of people. 2 to 3% doesn't sound much, but it is. Men and women are affected equally. Any age can suffer from psoriasis or get it from the first time, but there tend to be a couple of peaks, and those peaks are the late teens through to the early 30s, or then again in the 50s and 60s. So that's when we tend to see it, although it can affect any age. It's not clear what causes the immune system suddenly to be triggered into this attacking mode whereby skin cells start to replicate too quickly. We don't really know why and what the triggers are. There is sometimes a family history, so that can obviously play a part. And flares can be triggered by stress, anxiety, an injury to the skin, infections, hormonal changes, and even medications. So it's individual to everybody. And as I've said, all we do know is that immune cells in the body, called T cells, become overactive. So instead of doing their job in their normal way, they start to get busier and busier. They act as if they're fighting an infection, for example, or healing a wound in the skin but they start to do that where there isn't an infection or where there isn't a wound and they start attacking normal skin. This produces inflammatory chemicals which the body produces naturally when there's an immune response and it's these chemicals which encourage the skin to grow rapidly. So what are the types of psoriasis? Well, the, the one that we know most and probably see the most is called plaque psoriasis. And so this is the overbuild of skin and you get very well-defined plaques, often round in shape, that are red, itchy, sore and can produce these white or silver patches. They can actually be anywhere on the body, but they're not usually on the, the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet or anywhere where skin touches skin, so for example in the groin. These plaques can shed their skin, so they, they actually shed this silver flaky skin. And for people that have got this really badly, they can actually just leave a trail of silver skin behind them. And I have patients who won't leave the house because they're too embarrassed by this. That's how bad it can get. 
Then there's pustular psoriasis. So this is where you get small white or yellow blisters and that's what they look like on white skin or they can look red on dark skin um, that can form on various different body parts. The skin around those pustules cracks, it flakes and it gets much thicker. If it only affects the soles of the feet and the palms of the hand, it's called palmoplantar pustular psoriasis or PPP for short. If it's over the whole body, which it can be, although it's rare, um, and if that does happen, it requires urgent medical attention. This is pustular psoriasis, generalised, and it's unstable, and it's prone to flares, and it does definitely need to be treated not by a GP, but in secondary care by a dermatologist. So that's pustular psoriasis. Then there's guttate psoriasis, and I see this a lot in GP. So this is where, generally on the torso, the front of the body and the back, you get little raindrops, salmon pinkish, sometimes flaky lesions. They are sometimes itchy, but not always. Um, they can be quite distressing because it develops very quickly, and it can cover the whole of the trunk and the limbs, and it can take weeks or months to get better. It's common or more common in children and younger adults and it quite often follows a streptococcal throat infection. So we often ask that question when we see, you know, have you had a sore throat recently? Because it tends to trigger gut ate psoriasis. It tends to get better on its own, but it can take months or weeks, as I've said. And if that is the case, if it's persisting, there are some treatments we can give. Then there's scalp psoriasis. So as it says on the tin, this is psoriasis in the scalp, so in the hair. It's similar to plaque psoriasis in that you do get plaques in the scalp. You get a thick buildup of skin, which often sheds and looks like dandruff. Um, you can get it sort of behind the neck and behind the ears, and it can get really itchy and tight. So the whole scalp feels tight. When it's really bad, you can get thinning of the hair and it can be treated with topical treatments and some of those are over the counter. You can get sensitive area psoriasis, so in the flexures, so by flexures we mean anywhere where there's a joint and a bend, so behind the knees, in the elbows, in the groin, um, even in the neck creases, basically around the genitals and in the skin folds. It gets very red and shiny, the skin and it gets really well demarcated and by that I mean you really see the edge of it so you'll go from very red shiny skin to normal skin with a clear cut off. It can often be mistaken for a fungal infection because of the way that it looks but it isn't and it may need a very specialised treatment plan to help cure it. And then there's nail psoriasis. So half of the sufferers of psoriasis and 80% of those who have got joint involvement will have nail psoriasis. Now nail psoriasis can exist on its own or it can come with other forms of psoriasis and with um, joint um, issues. So generally what we see is a discoloration of the nail, um, pitting which looks like little chunks out of the nails, splitting, thickening and lifting off of the nail bed. It's really painful, it's unsightly it can affect both fingers and toe function. So it can be so bad that the sufferer can't use their fingers or toes properly. So all of these different psoriasis, as you can see, have got you know, various different aspects to them, but they're all debilitating in their own way. So what are the treatments? This is where we go into the unpronounceable words, I'm afraid, so bear with me. The first thing to note is that psoriasis can be treated but not cured, very similar to eczema. The treatment has to be individual to each patient because each patient will have a slightly different form of psoriasis and it will be affecting them in a different way. And you need to treat the patient as a whole, not just treat the psoriasis, treat the emotional, physical aspects of it. You know, speak to them about how it's affecting them and see what else you can do to support them or, or direct them to support. Treatment generally can be divided up into four different areas. So you've got topical treatments that you put on the skin. UV light treatments, so similar to some beds but not, and I'll explain later. Systemic medications, so medications that you swallow, tablets. And biological treatments, which tend to be injections. 
So I'll go through those four. Starting with topicals. So topicals are the mainstay of treatment. And when you see a GP for the first time with psoriasis, you will get topical treatment for sure. So starting with topicals, so the things that we put on the skin, and if you go to a GP, the first thing you're going to get is a topical treatment for sure, because it's the mainstay of treatment. It's really important to start with moisturisers and emollients. So moisturisers that you put on the skin to keep the dryness away and to soften up those scales on top of the plaques. And then to add things to your bath water to just help keep that moisturised um, situation going because it's absolutely key in the treatment of psoriasis. If that on its own isn't keeping things at bay, then we move on to steroids. And we use steroids when the psoriasis is affecting less than 5% of the total body area. And steroids are always short term. You have to have a break in between using them for more than two weeks because they can thin the skin. And we use them for flares. So we use the moisturizers to keep things at bay, but when things are flaring, then we use things like Betnovate, Dermavate, Umavate, um, Dovabet, um, various different steroids. And they go all the way from mild through to extra potent. So we really have to be careful with those and work our way up the ladder because you want to be on the mildest steroid that you can, but you also want to keep the psoriasis at bay. So it's finding the balance. Then there are vitamin D analogue creams. So vitamin D analogues slow the skin replication, so they slow down that turnover that's causing the problem and they encourage normal skin to grow. They're better than steroids for long-term use because they don't have the same side effects. So if you're really, really struggling with the steroids in terms of having the break that you need, sometimes the vitamin D creams can actually step in and take their place. Um, examples of the kind of things that we're talking about are Dovonex or Taka... See, here we go. Takalcitol. I'm sure that's completely wrong. But they're vitamin D creams, which is much easier to say. Then there's coal tar. Now coal tar has been around forever and is one of the, probably the best known treatments for um, psoriasis. There are some of them available over the counter. They weren't available for a while but they are now. Um, they're really good for scalp psoriasis, so coal tar shampoos. Modern ones are less smelly than the old ones because these things are smelly. There is no getting away from it and it does hang around but it is a really good treatment. You can also get bath additives and soaps. So coal tar, really good, no side effects, so you can use that as much as you want. Then there's dithranol um, preparations. So when you've got well-defined plaques, um, careful application to the actual plaque, but being really careful not to get this onto normal skin, um, these can work quite well. They're not good for gut ache psoriasis and they're no good for sensitive places. So you can't use them on the face, skin folds or genitals um, just because they can really damage the normal skin. So they need careful use. There are some available over the counter and then the rest on prescription. And then there's calcineurin inhibitors which block calcineurin. So this reduces inflammation because that's involved in the whole inflammation process. Again, they're better for long-term use than steroids because they don't have those skin-thin side effects of steroids. So examples of a calcineurin cream is Protopic or Elidel. So those are the um, skin topicals and those are the ones that you'll always use. Even if you have to have other treatments that I'm going to go on to, you'll always have topicals because it's part of the whole management process and keeping it at bay. And it's quite often a case of trial and error, finding out which ones work for you. So then there's UV light therapy. So only UVA and UVB are helpful in psoriasis, so that's the first thing to know. And what it does is it reduces inflammation. So there are two types of light therapy. There's narrow band UVB, and this is really good for guttate and plaque psoriasis. And then there's PUVA. And PUVA combines UVA and sorelin, which is a chemical which makes the skin more sensitive to those UVA rays. And this is really good for hands and feet and psoriasis, which can be quite tricky to treat. And it's much better at thicker plaques. As I said, this is not a sunbed. So it's not the same as a sunbed. So don't think going to a sunbed will just do the trick. It's very, very carefully measured when it's delivered. 
because we have to think about skin cancer risks in the long term and there's a lifetime limit to how much UV light therapy you can have for psoriasis but your dermatologist will work that out very carefully for you. Then there are systemic treatments. So systemic treatments are taken as a tablet and they affect the whole body, they don't just target the psoriasis. They're really for moderate to severe psoriasis which hasn't responded to topicals and UV light. Because obviously when we're affecting the whole body we have to think about long term effects. They can sometimes treat um, arthritis, so that's the benefit of a systemic treatment rather than a topical which is not going to treat that arthritis. Um, you can try different ones if they're not working, so there are quite a few different ones in the class, so don't think just because you've tried one and it didn't work, there's no point trying the other systemic treatments, because there is, because different ones work for different people. So there are four main ones that I'm going to talk about today. So there's cyclosporin, there's um, acetretin, there's skillerants, and or Tesla. So I'll just go through those for you. Sorry, I didn't mention methotrexate as well, so there's methotrexate. So methotrexate is taken weekly as a tablet. You can't have methotrexate if you're pregnant, if you've got liver problems, kidney problems, or you drink too much alcohol. In fact, you really shouldn't drink while you're on methotrexate. So that has to be taken into consideration before starting it, if you do want to continue having a glass of wine. So what are the risks of having um, methotrexate? Well, it suppresses your immune system. It's an immunosuppressant. So you're more at risk of infections. It can damage your liver and kidneys. So you will need, need to have regular blood checks to test for that. And there's a very small risk of a cancer in the long term because your immune system is suppressed. So a blood cancer like lymphoma, that risk is, however, very tiny, but it is there. Side effects of methotrexate are nausea, tiredness, diarrhea, mouth ulcers, rashes and hair loss and as I've said making you more prone to infection. Okay, cyclosporin. So cyclosporin is a tablet or a liquid that you take every single day. Again it's an immunosuppressor. You can't have it if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. If you've got high blood pressure, kidney problems, if you're already immunosuppressed, so for example having cancer treatment, or if, you're ha if you have cancer. You have to be careful on cyclosporin if you're taking aspirin or ibuprofen, which are obviously easily available over the counter, also St John's wort or grapefruit juice, because these can increase or decrease the levels in your blood. So that's always important to remember. You can't take it for more than two years, but that's normally enough anyway as a treatment. The risks of cyclosporin are kidney damage, raised cholesterol, raised blood pressure. Um, again, a very small risk of a skin cancer, and we don't use cyclosporin if you've had lots of UV light treatment because it increases the risk of skin cancer. So whereas methotrexate, it looks like it might be a risk of lymphoma, with cyclosporin it's skin cancer. Tiny, but there. Side effects of cyclosporin are nausea, headaches, um, hair growth in places where you wouldn't want it, you're not going to end up with a beautiful thick head of hair. Gum tissue overgrowth, so you, all of the, the gums around your teeth can overgrow. Um, Flu-like symptoms and tiredness. So, acetretin, which um, is a retinoid essentially, which we quite often use for acne, it's very good for skin. Um, there is a brand name here, I'm going to try and say it for you. Neotigason. Neotigason. There you go. So we don't know really why retinoids work in psoriasis, but we think they slow down skin replication. We only use it for very severe psoriasis. It's a daily capsule, and we use it in conjunction with PUVA, and that's the UVA light therapy. It can take up to 12 weeks to work, and you can't have it if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, or even a childbearing age, unless you can prove very clearly that you have um, a good contraceptive like a coil, for example, and have a regular pregnancy test. And you can't get pregnant for two years after stopping this. It really is damaging to pregnancy, so you really can't have um, fall pregnant for two years. And you can't donate blood, and the reason for that 
is that that blood could be given to a pregnant woman and that would be dangerous. Side effects, of, as I've said, are birth defects should you get pregnant. Skin or lip dryness, and I can't underestimate, underestimate, overestimate even, how bad that can possibly be. Um, hair thinning, nosebleeds, headaches, and muscle aches. But having said all of that, it's a brilliant drug. It works really well in acne, so we do use it all of the time. Um, but the side effects, you know, people learn to tolerate. And then there's Otesla, and the other name I have for this is Apromilast. And this we use for mild, sorry, for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis and active arthritis. You take it twice a day as a tablet. Um, you can't take it if you're lactose intolerant, pregnant or breastfeeding, have a kidney disorder, or if you're underweight, because it can cause weight loss. Side effects are diarrhea and nausea, Upper respiratory tract infection, so sinusitis for example, a cough, a loss of appetite, headaches and fatigue. Now this is quite a new drug so we only have information from trials but in the trials there were some people who were getting or reporting depression. So you must tell a doctor if you suffer from depression or low mood and if you start taking the drug and you think your mood is changing and that's really important. And then finally, in the systemics, scilarants. And so this is for severe, severe psoriasis only, and it's if you're not tolerating any of the other biological, sorry, systemics, and if, if the others haven't worked at all. So you would only go to this if all else had failed. So you can't have it if you've got stomach problems, kidney problems, intestine problems, basically any lower GI tract problems if you're pregnant or breastfeeding and children can't have this. So you would go to daily dosing over four weeks and gradually over each one of those weeks the dose would be increased slightly until you get to your maximal dose at about five weeks. Side effects are reddening of the skin both on the face and the body, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, bloating and immunosuppression. So as with all of the systemics you'll be more um, susceptible to infections. There are a couple of really serious side effects. So there's a kidney disorder called Fanconi disease um, disorder and then there is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy which are serious side effects. So this is a serious drug and one that would only be used after you had failed on everything else including the biologicals um, and the reason for that is that these there are serious side effects. But obviously, if things aren't working, people still need solutions. So skillerance is that last chance solution, as it were. But hopefully most people will find a solution before they get there. Then in terms of biological, which is the final arm of um, our treatment, they're designed really to return the immune system back to its normal state. So it stops attacking the skin and stops causing the psoriasis. NICE has gives, given a list of the biologicals that can be used in psoriasis and I will put a link to that, the NICE guidelines, in the notes afterwards. So I'm going to run through their names or I'm going to try, um, but this is where it's all going to go horribly wrong. So we have Enbrel, which is a Tanacept. We have Humira, which is Adilumumab. We have Kynthium, which is Rodulumab. We have Talts, which is, and this is impossible, Ixakizumab. Then we have Consentix, which is Secukinumab. Then we have Tremphia, which is Guselkumab. Remicade, which is Infliximab, which is probably the easiest of all of them. And basically you would be put on these if you'd not responded to um, light and systemics. So just running through those for you quickly. So Enbrel, etanercept, um, we use that in severe psoriasis in anyone over the age of eight. Um, it's an injection under the skin. Um, it mustn't be used if you've got an in existing infection, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, and you shouldn't get pregnant or breastfeed feed for three weeks after stopping this. You can't use it if you're already immunocompromised, if you've got heart failure or, or cancer. Side effects include dizziness, a sore throat, a cough, abdominal pain, headache, tiredness, and injection site reactions. So where you inject gets red and hard. And it does make you more prone to infection, as all of these will. 
The next one is Humira, and that's an injection again. And again, it's for severe, severe plaque psoriasis, and this can be used in anyone over four. You mustn't use it in um, active infection, pregnancy or breastfeeding, and you mustn't get pregnant for five months after Humira. You mustn't use it if you've got multiple sclerosis or any other neurological disease in the elderly, anyone with heart failure or cancer. Side effects include dizziness, sore throat, cough, stomach pain, um, upper respiratory tract infections like sinusitis, swelling around the injection site and tiredness. Then we have Kynthium or Brodolumab. Again, severe psoriasis and again an injection. Not if you've got active infection, pregnancy or breastfeeding. And this one, you mustn't get pregnant or breastfeed for 12 weeks. And you mustn't use it if you've got Crohn's because it can make Crohn's worse. Side effects of this one are joint pain. So it's not ideal if you've got psoriasis arthritis. Um, headaches, tiredness, diarrhea, fungal infections, throat or mouth pain. It can actually cause neutropenia, so suppression of your neutrophils, so you're less able to fight infection and are therefore more prone to infections. And again, we only have trials on this one because it's quite a new drug, but in the trials, depression was noted by people using it. So again, if you get any change in mood or you're feeling depressed, speak to your doctor. The next one is touts or ixakizumab. Again, severe psoriasis, but also active and progressive um, psoriatic arthritis. Again it's an injection and you mustn't use it if you have active infection, you're pregnant um, and you mustn't get pregnant for at least 10 weeks after stopping this. Again you mustn't use it in Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. I'm doing well today aren't I? Or if you're immunocompromised. It's a new treatment so we have limited information about this only from trials again. Um, but we know that it can cause upper respiratory tract symptoms, injection site reactions, mouth and throat pain, nausea and fungal infections. The next one is Concentrix, which is Secukinumab. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's an injection. You mustn't use it if you've got an active infection. You're pregnant and you mustn't use it for 20 weeks. So you mustn't get pregnant for 20 weeks after you stop using it. Be careful again in Crohn's and latex allergy for this one. Latex allergy for this one. Side effects include upper respiratory tract infections, diarrhea, but again, it's a very new drug, so we've only got reports from trials. So as we start to use the drug, we'll probably see more things. The next one is Tremphia. This is <coughs> Guselcumab. Only for adults, not for children, this one. Again, not in active infection, not if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, and you mustn't get pregnant for 12 weeks after finishing Tremphia. Side effects are upper respiratory tract infection like symptoms, headaches, joint pain, diarrhea, gastroenteritis, fungal skin infections, herpes, um, in terms of skin infections, so herpes skin infections, and injection site reactions. One of the best known ones, and one we've been using for a very long time, is Infliximab, Remicade. Um, this is an anti-TNF um, <coughs> um, chemical. Um, it's an injection, as they all are. can only be used in adults. You mustn't use it if you've got active infection, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, and you can't get pregnant or breastfeed for six months after finishing Infliximab. You mustn't use it in people with multiple sclerosis or other neurological disease, the elderly, the immunocompromised, people with heart failure or cancer. But infliximab is very well used and can work really, really well. So those are the biologicals. Now, if you're on a biological, your dermatologist should encourage you to register with someone called Badbeer. That's B-A-D-B-I-R. It's the British Association of Dermatologists, Biologics, interventions register and essentially they are keeping a register of everybody on these drugs with side effects so that they can put together you know meaningful data so I will put that in the links afterwards for you as well but it's really important that if you are on these drugs that you take part in that so that we get the um, information that we want now 
There is research going on into psoriasis and I'm going to put a link afterwards to the Psoriasis Association which has some of that research and tells you how you can get involved if you have psoriasis. At the moment some of the things they're looking at are genetics in psoriasis, sleep deprivation caused by psoriasis and the risk of cancer with biologicals which is really I think important because you know, none of us wants to take a drug to fix something that gives us another problem. So that's an important area, but there are lots more. So I'm going to put that in the links afterwards. So I know that's a whiz through, a really, really complex and huge topic. And hopefully it's given you some information. More importantly, I'm going to put links in afterwards to the Psoriasis Association, which has got all of this information broken down for you so that you can really have a good read and pick off the areas that are important to you. If you've got any questions or I haven't covered anything or I haven't pronounced the word properly, which I'm sure there are hundreds, um, just give me some comments afterwards in the, in the comment section and I'll answer them for you. Any suggestions for um, future blogs, blogs, let me know and I will do it. Um, I might cover psoriatic arthritis because it's almost a topic on its own, um, but watch this space. And thank you as always for watching and making it to the end of this really difficult vlog.